Welcome, everyone. I think we've got an exciting session for the next hour and a half here. Uh, the session is femoral, popliteal, and tibial CTO. The goal of this session is to uh, present uh, solutions and problem solving for complex uh, femoral, popliteal, and tibial interventions. We have an uh, outstanding panel here uh, with presentations as well from Dr. R uh, John Runback, Nick Shamas, Sahil Parikh, Mark Burkett, Subhash Banerjee, Arthur Lee, and Manos Berlakis, who's going to bring the, the coronary CTO world over to the peripheral side to talk about commonalities. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Runback, who is going to uh, discuss his approach to crossing SFA occlusions. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, really enjoying uh, the meeting. Those cases we just saw were really spectacular. And, uh, you know, really is a good entree into uh, this session and my talk uh, in particular. So uh, here are my um, disclosures. Again, uh, no particular disclosures relevant to what I do here. I am going to uh, discuss devices uh, that we utilize in this uh, area with chronic SFA CTOs. Uh, and these are companies where I do have relationships. But again, um, that's loan shown here. So, you know, I hope I'm not too much of an embarrassment. And the reason I hope I'm not too much of an embarrassment is that, you know, uh, we're talking about SFA CTOs, so the thing that jumps to mind is CTO devices, and I'm not going to really talk about those, uh, at least not a great, uh, you know, depth, because the charge to me was my approach to SFA CTOs. So, you know, I apologize to all of, uh, all of you who uh, were expecting something uh, different, but I, I think you're going to see why we do what we do and how it works for us. You know, clearly this is the primary question, whether you need to be or want to be intraluminal, where you can uh, theoretically preserve treatment options. And interestingly, I wrote here harder, uh, although I saw there's a poster outside that Dr. Banerjee contributed to with 388 patients with sub or intraluminal recanalization from the XL pad registry, where at least in that experience, sub was harder. That's not been our experience. Uh, intraluminal is potentially device intensive and more expensive. You know, I published on the treatment algorithm for SFA using this whole cadence approach where the E in cadence is economic considerations, or C is cost. And, um, you, know, uh, you know, clearly we're making, uh, you know, economic decisions in the cath lab on a regular basis. So that's something that, you know, uh, is an additional burden for intraluminal and the cost of those devices, uh, CTO devices. Uh, intraluminal recanalization, the long-term results are, you know, certainly uh, dependent upon the uh, lesion length. Uh, much more so, I believe, than for a subintimal approach. And, you know, this is not irrelevant, but when you're crossing that lumen, uh, which is sort of laden with, you know, very friable and embologenic uh, atheroma, there's a greater uh, risk of sort of downstream debris, which might be uh, a problem. At least that's my opinion on that, which may not be uh, shared uniformly. Subintimal, uh, certainly as we've uh, developed this over the past, oh my goodness, almost 25 years, is faster, uh, very reproducible. You know, I find this actually remarkable. You know, we used to get these SFA CTOs as surgical cases. Now they're an hour-long endovascular case, you know, using the subintimal approach. There are re-entry challenges. We're going to see that in just a moment. You have a chance of extending your occlusion, compromising collaterals, and worsening ischemia, which should not happen if you're uh, conscientious. And then, of course, that calcification that you get in the, uh, in the media is a major limitation to re-entering. So apart from that, uh, that uh, experience outside, the poster outside, this is uh, a well-cited publication from Japan talking about initial and mid to long-term uh, results after subintimal versus intraluminal treatment of femoral popliteal occlusions. And this is a, a pretty good uh, cohort over here. You can see 651 patients treated intraluminally, 251 patients treated subintimally, at least by intent. Uh, but there was a quarter crossover with intraluminal. I'd argue that if you were to use IVIS, it's probably a much higher number with these CTOs where you're in and out of the uh, uh, lumen. And if you sort of look as the, uh, you know, kind of per, uh, you know, actual treatment uh, protocol here, you see with the crossover, in the end, 54% of patients were intraluminal and 46% of patients were subintimal. Uh, but despite that, they had essentially the same outcome. So, you know, certainly in this, you know, good, large, you know, uh, you know data set, there was no disadvantage in terms of patency 
uh, uh, to really working that you know extra measure to stay interluminally. And we sort of took this to heart, although we've been doing this for many years. So how do we approach this? So I'm going to show you something uh, maybe that you've seen before or maybe different from what you've experienced before. So our approach is always contralateral. I was actually talking to uh, somebody uh, just before this with some new devices that may allow a uh, anti-grade approach. But you know you kind of need the working room. You need purchase in the artery to mobilize your devices. So we tend to use a contralateral uh, access using some of those tricks that we saw in that last case for steep bifurcations and calcified bifurcations to allow good placement of an up and over 7 French by 55 centimeter sheath in almost all uh, instances. And you can you know, choose the sheath from whatever company you prefer. You can see this particular case, there's Profunda disease as well. You can argue maybe all we need to do is treat that. And a flush uh, SFA calcified chronic total occlusion. And this is everybody who walks through the door in our lab, reconstituting down the level of the ductal canal with additional popcorn calcification uh, you know, at the uh, P1 segment. And what we do is you know, we come up and over with our sheath and we actually take a, a curve on the sheath dilator so it's angulated immediately towards maybe this uh, little origin or maybe you can't even see this little uh, origin. And just with that sheath, we now go um, with a uh, glide wire advantage and almost always can create this initial wire loop, which looks like it's large and ill form, but you know, this is just the sheath to initiate that uh, loop. Um, and uh, you know, once we sort of initiate uh, that loop, you know, obviously now we're going to sort of, you know, go ahead and here you can sort of, sort of see propagating this loop further down. And what we find is often that loop is wide, but as we propagate it down, it gets a little narrow. And the other thing that we do, which is very different, is don't use a catheter. We actually go and support this with a 5 millimeter, 200 centimeter long hydrophilic coated balloon. So we're coming down with balloon and wire. And sometimes, to tell you the truth, once you create that knuckle, the whole thing will just sort of advance down as you do a blunt microdissection through that subindimal uh, plane. Otherwise, it's an incremental advancement of the wire with a big loop, bring down the catheter, shorten the loop. You don't want to get it straight. You want to maintain the knuckle configuration. That's what the Japanese call it. But it's sort of advancing, bringing down, shortening. Try to keep a relatively short uh, uh, loop, particularly as you get down to the reentry uh, uh, point. And this way, we sort of go and we sort of sequentially uh, advance this. You can see a little more progress here, even with this dense calcification, a little more progress here. And then spontaneous reenter in our experience about 80% of the time. Confirm that you're uh, intraluminal downstream. Uh, uh, you know, this is a little bit different. This one had a orbital atherectomy uh, through this, even though we were in and out. You know, we had some difficulty advancing uh, catheters over it. Most of the time, like I said, the balloon's in place. So you just balloon, and then you can finish your therapy. So it's a five millimeter balloon. Uh, and then in this case, we did some orbital and we followed this up with DCB. And again, a little controversial here. Uh, you know, we've been avoiding scaffolds in these uh, planes. We're starting to get some uh, data on this. But if you have a uh, lumen that looks like this, we're accepting that there's some irregularities, there's good flow. Uh, we just send them home, we follow them up with duplex, and we do find quite a bit of positive remodeling. And certainly, if you look at the drug eluding balloon experience for long femoral popliteal lesions, again, probably many of these interluminal, uh, subintimal, although not uh, uh, recognized, uh, very, very long uh, lesion lengths. And, uh, you know, these patients actually do uh, very, very, uh, you know, well. Restenosis rates uh, are low. This is a little bit different. So here we uh, have a long uh, SFA CTO. In this case, is uh, an origin to this. Reconstitute much lower, uh, you know, definitely more challenging, more distal point of reconstitution. And here we've come down with our technique. And just sort of like saw uh, in that last case with Andre, we're kind of dilating as we go if we're not uh, immediately reentering to sort of get a working plane. In this case, you can see we never can uh, achieve reentry, and we're relatively low here. We don't extend. This is a good role now to bring in your reentry device. So here's our reentry device in this case, and uh, doing multiple oblique projections, even with the calcium, sometimes using you know, a little forward pressure on that needle, you now re-enter, go ahead, complete therapy, uh, and you know, use DCB technology predominantly or supera across the knee. Avoid other technologies across the knee, which can be very lossy interventions, uh, and then sort of complete your therapy. In this case, this one required a long scaffold, which is only a bailout when we don't have a satisfactory result with angioplasty alone. How about this case? So again, very complex chronic total occlusion, densely calcified. These are starting to kind of look the same, one uh, on top of the other. You now understand our technique to sort of uh, get this subintimal plane around this calcium. Again, this is a case where we couldn't reenter, and uh, you know, uh, very low, couldn't get uh, a reentry device to position. So what do we do uh, uh, in a anterior position? I was talking about this in the last session. This is an anterior puncture of the P3 segment uh, with roadmap guidance. 
This now allows us to sort of get a wire up. You create subintimal planes, antegrade and retrograde, uh, which we call our, our rendezvous technique. And eventually, in that subintimal plane, you're now able to direct that wire up into an angled uh, catheter, whether it be uh, Judkins or just a uh, angled uh, uh, catheter, and uh, go ahead and get through and through access. Now, you're going to want to get balloon hemostasis here at the bottom. This looks messy. What this picture is is now, once we've gone ahead and uh, reversed the wire and passed it you know, beyond the popliteal uh, puncture, we get a balloon in place. We pull back the sheath to adjust just outside of the artery, and then having learned this from the Japanese, we inflate the balloon, inject thrombin on top of the artery, you know, to get, help achieve uh, hemostasis. Uh, five minutes balloon inflation. You can see in this particular case, um, uh, not a good result, but I talked about this the last case too. Once we put the Viabon in this particular one, we went back and did some focal force. I think I remembered I did not I didn't include that, but, uh, and had a very nice end, uh, lumen. How about a slightly different approach? Uh, again, talked about this last one. Now the SFA and the POP are occluded, so this is even a longer occlusion, uh, very, very compromised. But, you know, we find we get retrograde access. The vessels actually look quite a bit more robust than you appreciate uh, with the uh, reconstituted uh, image. Uh, in this case, we came retrograde. You know, the use of some of these uh, Terumo slender sheaths has really been beneficial here, allow low bore access. In this particular case, we actually worked retrograde with six French slender sheath down in the ankle, uh, did a retrograde re-entry directly into the uh, origin of the superficial femoral artery, and because it's so calcified, after vessel prep, did a, uh, a superior up top and completed therapy. Uh, so certainly there are options when long scaffolding is needed. I just showed you that, bare metal stents, drug eluting stents, and stent grafts. This is some of the Zilver PTX, you know, uh, 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 drug eluting stent uh, uh, data showing that for very long lesions, you can see it here, long lesion uh, data set, primary patency close to 80%. Here's some uh, uh, data from Viper with uh, Viabonds, again, showing even with long lesions, uh, you do well, and no difference with the Viabon between long and short lesions because you really worry about edge stenoses rather than stenoses along the course of this. So uh, in summary, we uh, offer a primary subintimal strategy for long femoral popliteal CTO. Sorry to you know, kind of let you down. We prefer a hydrophilic balloon as our original crossing device with a hydrophilic uh, wire. If necessary, rendezvous approaches can be... Uh, uh, needed to avoid extending the dissection and to really facilitate uh, uh, success when there's dense calcification. Uh, we're looking at DCB alone and leaving a little bit of uh, irregularity. Otherwise, you know, we place scaffolds, but we limit the scaffolds for the most part to entry exit unless there's luminal compromise along the whole submittimal uh, track. And when we do use scaffolds, we like both DES and uh, Viabons. Thank you for your time.